Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food. When did your neighborhood start? Uh, about uh, about 1982. Is it true that you guys started to protect yourself from white punk rock gangs? Yeah, it was a. Uh, Burbank's a pretty racial city. Um, back when I I moved in, I think there was about 10, 15, 16 family Mexican families in the whole city. Uh, as far as the my side of the city where I moved to. Mm -hmm. Um. I think there was one black family and there was a lot of uh, whites. So uh, the whites got a punk rock group together and they actually had a couple Mexicans in there and a black that used to uh, write swastikas. But these what? kids were really confused. They were really confused. Um, these, these kids used to drive around in their trucks because they all had money. These kids, mm -hmm. some of them, they were a lot older than us, um, so they had money and um, they had cars, and they would drive around the junior highs and catch Mexicans walking down the street and beat them up, um, take them out of the parks, uh, wherever they can run around. Them, they were gonna, they were gonna rush and attack uh, Mexicans. Mm. And around that time, I um, started to run around with a guy that uh, grew up on Elmwood. He grew with born, raised there, and I started to run around with them. And um, I, I knew it was a little rough part of town. That was a little, that was a little rough area right there. Uh, there was a lot of different gangs there, a lot of different people out there partying right there because of the girls. And you know, they would bring like guys from eighteen, White Fans, Avenue, Frog Town, Unaville. Oh, there was a hundred different gangs there. Yeah, and. Um, when 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 we started to run together playing football and stuff, um, we started watching each other's backs, and that's where my neighborhood originated from. Now, how how were you around this time? I want to say about um, maybe I want to say about fifteen. Me myself. Okay. I was okay. actually running around with the gang in East Los Angeles. Um, at the time, and I, my intentions were to get into that gang, but I never did. I didn't get into it. Um, what gang was that? I'm just curious. Avenues. Okay. The original thing, our original plan with the guys that played football and ran around with us was we were going to protect ourselves against the white boys. And if it came down to it, we were going to go at it with the white boys, but no other Hispanic gangs wasn't like we were planning to be a gang. Now, these white boys had a... Uh, some kind of alliance with West Side Canton in North Hollywood. Hmm. So um, one day we were we were walking to actually get chips and sodas or something because we're too young to buy beer. Um, so we were walking to the gas station. I see some guy from Canton that my brother actually knew that grew up around us. So I knew where he was from, but he to me he was just another gangbang. I wasn't really tripping on him. So I walked by, he says hi, I said hi, I shook my head, nod at him, like, what's up? <clears throat> like three of us. About half an hour later, this fool rolls up with a bunch of fools. Um called in south and banging on us. And um one of my homeboys took took flight and that's where it started. It just kept going after that. It was like, all right, you wanna come out there? We're gonna come right back at you. It, was, it wasn't really an intention until later that we really decided to get serious with things as far as being a gang. Mm -hmm. And of course it was because of a girl. Yeah, how, how so? Because <laughs> originally my neighborhood was called Burbank Executioners. And the reason we called the Burbank Executioners was because that was a football team that we had made up that we were playing. So we didn't know um, like we weren't planning to be a gang, so it was Burbank Executioners. Um, it wasn't until later when 
you know, we be posting up all G'd up, all gangstered out, and girls would drive up, and they're like, hey, where you guys from? And they were like, oh, we're from Burbank Executioners. And what time these girls laughed at us? Like, oh, wow. hey, we're gonna have to change the name, dog. <laughs> we already you know, yeah. kicked it on Elmwood, so we changed the, the executioners to Elmwood. That's what does the Rifa mean? Because there's a few gangs in LA that have the Rifa title. The rules. What does that exactly mean? Rules. Barrio, neighborhood, Elmwood rules. That's what it stands for. Gotcha. Who are some of the original members? Um. <clears throat> It was my brother, uh, Indio, that's Indio, uh, my homeboy Psycho, my homeboy Boxer, my homeboy Negro, my homeboy Little Man, Smiley, my homeboy Chino, and I think that's it. What years were you most active? Me, myself, or my neighborhood? No, you, you personally. <clears throat> I was probably most active between 1985 um, to 1992 when I got cracked, and then when I came again, but that that was like fairly, um, fairly quick. You know, I realized that I was already older. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they say time stops when you're in prison, so I was mm-hmm. gone for for eight years. Were we convicted for? Oh, okay. Uh, originally, I got 36 to life. I got we're convicted Ooh. of a murder, attempted murder, 12 attempts, 12 assault with a deadly weapon. And then after trial, everything was six assaults, one attempt, and one murder. So I got 36 to life. Mm. As I went through um, appeals, the murder got dropped. Um, the attempt, they kept me on the attempt, but the other assaults got dropped. <clears throat> so, um, by the time everything was said, then I had um, gang enhancement, gun enhancements. Um, I didn't completely get off on appeals, but I got uh, the majority of the knockdown. What uh, was it like stepping into prison for the first time? Um, the first. <laughs> I got a, I got a couple of good stories about that. Okay, when you go, I got shot up to um, Delano reception, and they put me in D two, no D three, D three, um, which was everybody had pretty much like uh, three or four years, two years, sixteen months. Some people were just getting what they call turnaround, where they get right out right away. I was the only one with the light term. For some reason, I got put on a bus with nothing but people that had little time. I was actually supposed to be on a bus with everybody had a lot of time. But for whatever reason, they put me in the wrong bus. I landed up up in Delano. Um, I walked into the reception R&R, off the bus. They took my cuffs off me, told me to strip out and to go in the cell. I, as soon as I went in the cell, they locked it. So I'm like, okay, this is something new. I didn't know. You know what I mean? I didn't know what was happening. <clears throat> so I started to notice everybody else coming in. And they were going into a separate cell. And they were handing them clothes. Here's the clothes. But me, I'm by naked. I'm like, okay, what's, what the hell's going on? So uh, I, I go to use, I want to use the restroom. And so I go, I go to flush the toilet. The toilet do not work. What the hell? What's up? And I tell the cop, hey, the toilet's not working. Can I get some toilet paper? Because they didn't even have toilet paper. And he's like, uh, no, we'll be in there right now. SSU's going to talk to you. Special service unit. Mm. He goes, so the toilet's got to be off. So as soon as they get in there, SSU come, they come in and they start questioning about who sent me. Um, I told him the city, uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff sent me. Who the think sent me? Excuse my language. I told him, who, who do you think sent me? And they go, well, um, you weren't supposed to be in that bus. So you guys pulled some strings to get you on that bus. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, dude. They sent me up here 
because I got busted. I got to do my time. So they took me from there and they x-rayed my ass. Hmm. They, took, <laughs> they went in and made sure that I had nothing in there. And I actually did it. I didn't have nothing in there. So um, they take me and they... They, they put me back on uh, D3. Well, they put me in D3. I stayed there for about two two weeks. And then they shot me to, I think it was D4 or D5 was the life building. Like, my mother passed away when I was in reception. So yeah. I had them threatening to send me to the hole for, every, for everything. And I looked at somebody funny. It was, you want to go to a hole? So um, that was my first thing. When I hit Mainline in Corcoran, I actually made, I, I don't know if it's a its a, a mistake of a, a, a new first-termer, but when I came, they put me, they asked me, where are you from when you walk into the building? They, I've been Corcoran. Corcoran, anybody knows back then, it was infamous. There was a B, Yard B, there was a level four, <clears throat> So I walk in, and there's a podium right in the front when you come through the gates, the doors. Well, it's cages. So I walk in, and they tell me, where you from? And I told them, I ain't from anywhere. I, and, and mind you, they just gave me 15 years for saying I'm from Elmwood. So I wasn't about to tell anybody I'm from anywhere else, you know what I mean? Ah, uh, okay. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm young, I'm dumb. I'm like, nah, I ain't from anywhere. She goes, well, are you a northerner or are you a southerner? And I told him, uh, told him I told him, I ain't from anywhere. He goes, well, where were you born? I go, I was born in Los Angeles. He goes, then you're Sureño. He goes, but since you put with me, I'm going to with you. Ah, whatever, dude. So he puts me in the cell 202. <clears throat> That's upstairs. That's the second cell in the beginning of the there's like a big uh, U. It looks like a U. So uh, they got a bunch of, I think it's 18 cells per row. So they put me in two, 202. And um, when Chow comes out, I have a, I have a vice as a Sally. I walk out and I go to Chow. So I'm walking to Chow. I see a bunch of homies. And I see an older guy. You know, you got a big brush, he's tattooed, you look like a fool, you know? Like, all right, homie, I'm gonna go introduce myself to this dude because I want to mm -hmm. be one of them. I want to be known. I didn't want nobody messing with me. I'm gonna make my bones right now. So I walked to this guy, told him, he goes, he goes what's up, homie? I go, what's up, huh? Um, I go, they call me Sunny Boy from Elmwood Street, Los. And he looks at me, he goes, your homies are back there. And I looked at him like, what? what are you talking about? And then it snapped to me that he's a Norteño. Uh. He's the shot color for the Norteños. So I was like, oh, man. So I went to, um, I waited for my people. I got acting like, tie my shoe. I waited for my people. And my people were laughing. Because they were like, who are you over there talking to a Norteño? I shut up, <laughs> you know I'm young. I don't know, so um, he goes, nah, don't worry. When you get to uh, a certain point in time, you're gonna know what a Norteño looks like over a homie, which I did. I learned, you know, I could look, I could tell Norteño right off the bat. Well, how? But, uh, I'm curious. How? Excuse me. How? What would be some tell tell signs? Um. The way there's, there is a little tweak, a small tweak uh, of their personality different from un sureño. A norteño, un sureño, there's a little tweak that's different. And, and, and it's hard to, hard to describe, but if I look at something for a second and they say something and they move a certain way, I know they're norteño mm. right off the bat. Corcoran, I stayed there uh, about nine months, and they moved me up to Centinella, and that's where I really did all my time, a lot of my time. Are Norteños and Sorenos still separated in prison? 
at, at the time, yeah, they were separated. I don't know about now. I don't. I don't know anything about the system now. But when I went in there, um, it was strictly forbidden for somebody like me to talk to a Martenio. Um I was actually um, because when you're on a level four. And I didn't understand when I first got in the potential. See, I used to listen to a lot of older guys. They tell me, as soon as you hit the joint, you get yourself a knife and put in your work. I was like, okay. That's not true. Because when I went to level four and I tried to do what I, they told me to do, I got checked pretty quick. I was like, hey. We all got to live here together. Don't start nothing you can't finish. And if you want something to do, we'll give you something. To do. Remember that? Shut your mouth. Yes, sir. A level four is more serious than any other yards. Threes are serious too. But I think people understand that the, in the threes and fours that there's more potential of an explosion than on a level one or a level two. So people are more cautious about what they do because they know how serious they can get. So you went in in 1992. That was a big year in L.A., probably the most um, homicides we had, I think, in, in, in history. Uh, gang homicides was in 1992. And uh, not only that, an interesting movie was released that year or the year after, but I know it was 92 or 93. It's American Meat. And you obviously didn't see it when it first came out. I don't know. Maybe you did. Maybe prison has a hookup like that. But uh, I'm assuming that you've seen it. And when you did see it, uh, how how close is it to reality of what you saw in prison? Um, <clears throat> I was actually around when they were making America Me because I lived in East Los Angeles. Um, I actually lived right a couple houses down from when they the bench that he got arrested on. <clears throat> so I actually watched a little bit of the movie. But actually, my car was actually in the movie, but um, they took it out. I guess, I don't know. They never showed that scene they were driving through because I had a 67 Impala. Mm. So my car was actually in the movie, but then whatever reason, they took it out. <clears throat> um, I didn't see the movie until... Actually, that was one of the first movies I wanted to see when I got out, was that in and Blood In, Blood Out. As far as the story, I, I don't know. It, you know, it's a, it's a Hollywood movie. Um, I didn't feel one way or another about the movie. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, you know, all right, you're, you're, I'm learning the same as you are when I'm watching that movie. I I I didn't get involved in stuff like that. I didn't um, participate in, in stuff like that. It's like, hey, you know what? That's out that's out of my league. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. As far as them speaking, I understood what what um, what they were saying. I understood that what was going to happen a little bit when watching the movie. I know what's right and what's wrong. Um, there is a movie that does. Uh, I I did watch when I got out was uh I think it was a couple of years after I got out that it came out it was called uh uh what, what is it called uh selling without Kilmer okay now if you want to know what prison feels like that's what prison feels like it takes you through all the emotions that's the most realistic prison movie I've seen I want to keep it on the movie topic actually okay there, there's been some very influential gang movies in the past, you know, 30, 40 years. And I want to ask you, how uh, how impactful do you think movies like Colors and movies like Boulevard Nights and things like that were to spreading gangs across the country? I, I, I think it has the reverse effect of what they expect to happen. I think they, they go in there to discourage gang members but at the same time, I think they're um, actually promoting and glamorizing it. <clears throat> because that gang life is not... It, you know, don't get it wrong. There is fun. I've, I've had so much fun, it's not even funny. 
but the sorrow of it, the bad part of it, outweighs the good part that's ever happened. Mm. You know, the fact that my best friend, you know, is gone. You know what I mean? My best friend was another one is in a wheelchair. Actually, two of them. Um, people passing away. It, 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 it's the sorrow, the the bad part of it, is far outweighs the good part of a game. You know. So and I think in the movies they they portray they um, portray that this this, this is glamorizing and it's not. You know these are kids. These are kids out here getting killed. This is not um some. If they approach it, they need to approach it a whole different way. Mm. Yeah, got it. Such a good point. That's they got a, a thing point. called machismo. It's like being macho, and yeah. they always portray that. They always portray that that uh, machismo when it comes to Rasa and gangs or even black gangs. The machismo part of it, but in reality, these are kids. If you really think about it, these guys are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. They're kids. Mm-hmm. You don't realize your kids until you're already older and you're like, man, I was just a kid when I was doing that stupid stuff. But see, that stupid stuff comes with serious consequences. No. Do you think the average uh, gangster, you know, or OG or veterano who's been through what you've been through, do you think they suffer from PTSD? I'm positive of it. Um, I, I personally I have been diagnosed with the P P S T O T or whatever post traumatic stress. Um, I I personally been I've been seeing a therapist for two and a half years now. And prior to that, when I was a kid, since I was I think about seven, I've been in therapy all the way until I hit prison. Then I was off therapy. I got off. I was in in therapy for many years until about two and a half years ago. And it was because when I get angry, um, and it started to get worse as the years went on without me um, addressing that issue of post-traumatic stress. I, 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 my ideals, my, my thoughts were a lot worse than before. And I, I was lucky enough to see it. Um, I would get angry with somebody over the smallest things. But me wanting to react to him was more, so far worse. You know what I mean? And it was always um, way overboard. All of them were going to give me a nice turn. So, yes, the, the P, PST, or POST, whatever, the post traumatic stress. Yeah. It's the real thing as far as us. It only gets yeah. worse as you get older, though. There's one thing that's positive about it that you're seeking therapy because I would say not, or you, know, you have, because 99% of, uh, of our people don't seek therapy. They think it's a sign of weakness. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to let you a little bit on my personal. Um, I've been here the whole time for my daughter. I wasn't here the whole time for my son. So there's a, a little bit of... Uh, space between me and my son he holds grudges towards me um and, and you know i can't blame him i was gone most of his life <clears throat> and he's getting he's already at the age now he's already 30 but he was at the age of um of rebelling you know what i mean doing things and saying things and acting like a man i'm a man and this that okay trying to test his limits with me as far as being a man, you know, like uh, man of the house. Now, during this process, which is a normal thing, um, I started to get thoughts in my head. And it wasn't like, like, okay, I'm gonna kick his ass. No, it was like, I'm gonna murder this guy. He keeps doing me, I'm gonna murder. He wants to test me, I'm gonna murder him. And I, I caught myself, I was like, what the? What am I talking about? This is my kid. Wow. This ain't that serious. There's something fucking wrong with me. And I, I've always been off on me. I, my, 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 
my anything I've ever said in my life, pretty much, is filtered. I will never tell you exactly what I'm thinking. And the reason being is because I know my thinking is off. So I always kind of try to think before I say anything. And it, 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 when I realized what I was thinking about my kid, I was like, you know what? I got to get help. Because if I don't, I'm going to kill somebody. It might not be him, but it's going to be somebody else. I got to get some help. So I went out of my way and I found help. And since I found that help, my aggression level has gone so far down. And out of all those years I had the therapy, I never, I never gave it a thought. I never tried it. I never. I just sit there, yeah, okay, whatever. Because they used to take me to free Kentucky Fried Chicken and when I was a kid. They would take me out to restaurants to talk to me. So I was, you know, I was getting the food. I'm getting whatever. It wasn't until I think about a year ago what we feel like. Well, my therapist and me figured out. What has made me the way I am? I had a, a uncle that was very abusive, physically abusive. He would just hit me, slap me, call me a bitch, and um, it affected me. My therapist and me figured out what has made me the way I am. I had a, a uncle that was very abusive. Physically abusive. He would just hit me, slap me, call me a bitch. And um, it affected me. It was like, I'm never going to be a bitch to somebody. So you want to you wanna call me that name, I saw my name, I'm going to hurt you. It's, you know, that's the way my thought process got. It, it was because, and I never even thought about it until um, he passed away and I heard about it. Mm. And when he did, I was actually upset because somewhere inside my head, I was thinking, when I see him, you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. I'm going to pay this fool back for everything he ever did to me tenfold. But it was the fact that I, 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 I when he passed, I, I broke down. I was like, hey, you know what the fuck? He got away from me. He got away from me. Oh, <laughs> it was yeah. just. But it wasn't until then that we realized what my problem was, why I was the way I was, the aggression I would take, and why I would snap. And I guess that was a peep. And then it didn't help that my parents were heroin addicts and fighting on the streets and bumper jacking people and, you know, fighting over dope, bringing people out that had passed away, um, bringing them back, you know. I learned that. I stayed about eight, nine years old about shoving ice cubes on somebody's butt to bring them out of a, an overdose. You know, my life, my life, I never really had a childhood because my mm. life was always mom, dad, or getting loaded. Something's going to pop off. I got to get busy, do whatever I got to do. It's always been like that my whole life. And that's why, like, with my kids, I try to be, you be a kid as long as you can. You enjoy life as much as you can. But at the same time, as I got older, things started to affect me more, and I started to get those bad thoughts. And that's what I had to stop and go to therapy. And I'm glad I have, because I am better. I could talk about things like this. Before, I never talked about anything like this. You are going to be really big if you continue doing what you're doing and just telling your story. There was a kid who really was close that I helped get out of his neighborhood, that I opened his eyes. Dude, and uh, me trying color. to help him, me trying to help him actually opened my own eyes to a lot of things that were happening. That's when I started to change. Wow. And Gil is actually from a rival neighborhood back in the days. Blood enemies. Really? So me, Gil were, yeah, if I would have run across Gil or I'm sure if I, if I he, he would have got me if I couldn't get him. Wow. Somebody would have got wow. him. And now you guys are and making I, matches happen. I get, I get um, backlash from my own neighborhood. Some of my homies, not all of them. So a lot of my homies are on a positive tip. Um, but I do get it from some guys um, that that they don't like it. Um, but it's usually those people that have never done anything. They were just acting tough, you know? Mm -hmm. So with the ones that actually were the ones that were riding, doing things, they were the ones that are, are actually supporting me. 
thank you so much for coming on the show. I would love to, you know, have you on in person, maybe even meet up with you. I'm in LA myself, meet up for lunch or something and just uh, chat a bit. Um, definitely keep this relationship going, man. Um, where can we find you? On American Cholo, on YouTube, and I'm Sunny American Cholo on IG. <clears throat> Sunny American Cholo on IG and American Cholo on YouTube. Trust me when I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you appreciate my content, you are really going to appreciate theirs. Uh, Kittle is a very charismatic dude. I had him on my show just a couple of weeks ago. So like I said, I'm still fresh to American Cholo, but I'm, I'm, I'm on now knowing that Sunny Boy is a, a big part of it. Uh, it's a, it, From what I've seen already, it's a dope channel, and I bet there's so much more content that I'm not even aware of. I encourage everyone out there to check it out. Sonny Boy, it's been a pleasure. You have a great night, man. I'll talk to you soon. It's a pleasure for having me on. Thank you very much. I much appreciate it. Thank you, my boy. Have a great night, dude. I'll talk to you soon. Peace, man. Okay. Bye-bye.